tonight I wanted to talk a little bit about a project that we have going on here at Mountain Gardens and that has to do with uh, what I call the east-west connection. So we grow a lot of Chinese herbs and Chinese plants in general. And there are a couple reasons for that. Uh, one of them we can see right here. So this is a map of eco-regions of the world. You can easily get to it from Wild World website or National Geographic. This is Wild World. No, worldwildlife.org. It's available a lot of places. Just breaks down the whole world into eco-regions, which has to do with the uh, temperature and moisture as it relates to plants growing. So here's the eastern United States, and here's East Asia. You can see the similarity, because we're both about the same latitude and... There's ocean on the east and a continental mass on the west. So the, as the colors go to red and, and orange and then yellow, it's getting drier and more desert-like. The greens and darker blues are more moist, temperate climate. So very similar bioclimatic regions. This uh, website is nice because here's a close-up of the eastern United States. And I had a close-up of China, but I seem to have misplaced it. Uh, there's the list of the ecoregions. So each ecoregion has a two or three page write-up, which talks about the main uh, forest types, you know, some of the endangered species, ecological issues going on there. So easy way to learn about uh, different provinces of China. You can go into forests in certain parts of China and every tree will be the same species as a tree here. Uh, but that's getting into another topic. So we have two things going on here. One is that the growing conditions are very similar between East Asia and Eastern United States. You can actually uh, get the climatic data for any point, like where you are on the East Coast, and find there are websites and the research has been done, find places in China that have the identical climate. So that's one connection. But the second connection is that the plants are in fact in East Asia and Eastern North America are in fact related to each other botanically. Uh, this is called the Great Botanical Disjunction. And there are a number of papers. People have been studying this for four or five hundred years. Botanists noticed early, early on this uh, resemblance between uh, many of the plants in East Asia and Eastern North America. So this this article is called Timing the Eastern Asian Eastern North American Floristic Disjunction. Molecular Clock Corroborates Paleontological Estimates. The Eastern Asian Eastern North American Floristic Disjunction represents one of the most prominent intercontinental disjunctions of closely related species. Approximately 60 genera of seed plants display this disjunction. This physiographic pattern has attracted the attention of botanists since the time of Linnaeus. That's pretty obvious. So I have a list here of these 60 genera. Ginseng would be the most obvious one. You have Panax ginseng over there, Panax quinquefolius here. Uh, but as I started to say, you could go into forests in China and every tree will be the same genus as a tree here. There'll be oak, a maple, a cherry, a tulip poplar, a magnolia. They'll just be different species, same genus, different species. Then you look down on the herb layer, and you can see black cohosh, Solomon seal, wild yam, ginseng, different species, uh, same genus. So one of our goals is to grow the Chinese species and the North American species side by side, like Solomon seal, for instance. The Chinese Solomon seal is a very highly regarded longevity tonic. Uh, our Solomon seal is, well, has not been used that way, but it might very well have such properties. In fact, the Solomon seal we have right here uh, at Mountain Gardens and in eastern North America is the giant Solomon seal, and I think the Chinese would absolutely love it. Uh, it's a very auspicious plant, Solomon seal. So that's one of our goals, is to grow these plants side by side and also to study up on the similarities and differences. 
So I've got a list here of many of the genera that have a species in China and a species here. Calamus would be a good example. Uh, the Asian Calamus, slightly different from the one in North America. Angelica. So one of the things I do, I have a class <clears throat> that I teach uh, called Medical Botany that I teach in in Asheville at Taoist Traditions College. And I have my students work on comparative papers where they compare the Asian species with the North American species in an effort to determine whether it could be used as a substitute medicinally or whether it should be used differently. Sometimes the conclusion is that we could use our species the same way the Chinese species is used. At other times it seems to be quite different. So at this point, uh, I have a lot of folders. This is only letter A. So actually, I think uh, Mountain Gardens has the one of the largest accumulations of information on this topic of using uh, our native herbs. And we're really trying to focus on the Appalachian herbs, although we don't exclusively do that. So we got here a chorus, that's Calamus, Achillea, Yarrow, comparing ours with the Chinese one. Agastache, Agrimony, Angelica, we compared several different ones. Aurelia, that would be uh, the uh, spikenard. Arctium, we did a comparison between the Chinese used the seeds for a particular purpose. In the West, it's the root of the same plant that's used medicinally. Artemisia, there are many, many species. We compared several of those. Astragalus asparagus, comparing the Chinese species with the European. There is not a native North American asparagus that I know of. And Aster we did also. So we've got a very large uh, accumulation of information and we'll be uh, summarizing this. But I do teach a workshop on the subject of how to incorporate our native herbs into your Chinese medicinal practice. And that'll be on the workshop schedule. Thank you.